of his word. Joshua chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. The context is Joshua and the people of God are about to cross the Jordan River into that land that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When they cross over, not only are the people of God going into their promised land, but also the judgment of God is coming across Jordan and it will begin at Jericho. Jericho is under the condemnation of God. And in the opening verse here, we are introduced to a harlot by the name of Rahab. The first place it seems uh, that these men go are into a harlot Rahab's house. See, she is under condemnation. She is part of a people there in Jericho. They are strangers. They are idol worshipers. They are the enemy of God. And ju judgment is about to come across the Jordan River. No one is exempt. God told Joshua, when you get over there, kill every man, every woman, boy, girl. Kill all the livestock. Don't touch any of the treasures. Don't touch anything. It's all an abomination. And and it's condemnation. But, uh, just straightly said, uh, she is part of a sinner race. She is a sinner. And we sugarcoat it and cover it up. But sinners are not going to be condemned. Uh, this Bible says they're condemned already. And one day Jesus is coming. And the judgment of God is coming on all of those who are his enemy. You're not going to be condemned. Your good uh, is not going to be well against your bad honey that won't work if you're not saved today you're condemned already she is we see her condemnation we see her corruption according to verse 13 of chapter 2 she is worried about her father and her mother and her sisters and her brother I surmise that she was the oldest of the children and for some reason she had to take care of the whole family she is under that pressure I mean we live in a day where pressure is coming in from every every side. If you're not careful, it'll lead you down a path that it led her down. I believe uh, that Rahab uh, is not just a, uh, I'm going to say it, I hope it won't offend anybody, I don't think she's just old crack whore or, or a crackhead slut. Uh, I believe she's a decent woman, uh, but pressure has led her. She's a young woman, she's beautiful, she doesn't have skills to make enough money to take care of a whole big family, but what she does is says, I know what I can do and she enters in. Have you ever wondered why if you read the book of James uh, he refers to her as Rahab the harlot. If you read about her in Hebrews she is the harlot Rahab. Why did the name uh, stay with her? I believe it's because it is an identifying name just like John the Baptist just like Simon the leper just like Alexander the coppersmith. It's not that she's wicked to the core because before we get done today you'll see she's not the same woman when the spies came into Jericho hallelujah as she will be when they walk out but I believe that it is a moniker if you will it is a title that is put to her name that shows us she chose a path but every time you choose the wrong path uh, you'll find out that it'll lead and it does to her it leads her into pain can you imagine at her letting those men do what they do and abuse her and take advantage of her and bring her out like a dish rag and throw her away uh, by the time uh, it will set in that she is trapped. She can't get out of this lifestyle. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you can't turn over new leaves. You can't make enough New Year's resolutions. You can't pull yourself out by the bootstraps. If you go down the wrong path, sin will trap you. It will always take you farther than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. Cost you more. She may have said, we'll just do this until we get back on our feet and we get a little breathing room uh, and then I'll straighten up uh, and all of a sudden she realizes she's trapped. She looks in the mirror. She no longer sees a beautiful young woman but she 
sees trash. Now that may not mean something to some of y'all because I can look at you and tell you was raised with silver spoons in your mouth. But when you was born on the poor white trash side of town and white trash called you poor white trash and everybody looked at you, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons wouldn't come by our house. Nobody come down on our side of the street and you begin, if you're not careful, you begin to listen to the voices you begin to think of yourself by what other people are saying and you'll get up in the morning and look in the morning and the pain and look at yourself and the pain will rivet through your person as you begin to believe you are who uh, the world says you are or the neighbors say you are or that up the up group says you are I'm going to just go ahead and tell you this if you're born again blood washed you are not who you think you are you're not who the devil tells you are hang on buckle up you're not even who you think you are you're who God says you are her corruption her condemnation but but the message this morning is about her change. She didn't know that when uh, Joshua sent those two men across Jordan to spy out the land, uh, she knew the judgment was coming. She knew that she was condemned. She knew that she was trapped in sin. But what she didn't know uh, was that the Lord uh, was going to enter into a harlot's house. And for a few minutes this morning, I'm going to preach on that thought. When the Lord enters a harlot's house, First of all, we'll see he entered the harlot's house with his servants. The Bible says in verse 1 that Joshua sent out two men. He sent out two men of God. He sent out two preachers, if you will. I'm going to just go ahead and stop right there if you ain't run ahead of me and say, how in the world can they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach? You can take the pulpit out and replace it with programs and puppet shows and light shows and singing if you want to. But God ordained by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And when those two men knocked on her door, she may not have realized it. She may not have recognized it. But God God had sent those men over there because even in amongst the condemned people the Lord was coming into her house. Thank God for my man of God who stood week after week and pointed that three foot long finger walked on pew, spit, sweat all over me, called me down openly in church, made me live right walk right, keep it tight spit white and drink sprite and I ain't recovering from it I ain't mad about it. Thank God maybe I'd be in hell hadn't been that God sent one of his servants thank God for a God called God sent man when he gets ready to visit a harlot's house he didn't go over there and get just anybody but he picked up just a, a chosen two and sent those men over there to a harlot's house now, I'm going to just say this the last place a Baptist preacher ought to be is at a harlot's house but I found out when God God gets ready to make a move. He doesn't care what people think about it. He doesn't ask you your opinion. He doesn't get anybody to vote on it. He just does what he wants to do. And these two men are representing the Lord himself and his people. And they enter this harlot's house. They not only sent, but they're serious. When they get over there, she realizes they're under condemnation. She, they doesn't say, oh, well... You know God loves you. You know God's going to make it all better. And they don't preach around until they mix it all together and make it all taste good. I'm going to just go ahead and tell you, I ain't coming under the umbrella of love. I ain't going alone to get along. I ain't changing Bibles. I ain't watering it down. Let me stop here and remind you, I started out an old slaughterhouse gospel preacher. And by the good grace of God, I'll finish up like one. I still believe there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from God's own vein and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all I said to lose all I, I said to lose a double L all there are guilty stains I still believe it take the shedding of blood or there's no remission of sin I still believe there's power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb it's time God's man square his shoulders back get a little swagger in his step quit playing games it ain't time to twiddle a thumb skin back that old black back 
book and preach thus saith the Lord it ain't popular and folks don't like it but it's time as we as God's people get serious again cause when God entered into this harlot's house he entered with his servants if you'll go with me to verse number 10 you'll find out that when he entered this harlot's house he not only entered with his servants but he entered with a story look at verse number 10 she said for we have heard for you got down here and preached God had already crossed Jordan and somebody had told them a story listen to this now he said how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you what's this phrase when you came out of Egypt Egypt's always been a type of the world always been a type of sin Pharaoh's a type in the Bible of the devil who had them in bondage but Rahab said for you ever got here we heard a story and that story was a story of deliverance how your God made a way when there was no way when Pharaoh and his army was the most powerful people on the earth. You can look at me like that if you want to. But the Bible says that Satan is the little G-O-D God of this world. We're no match for him in ourselves. But I'm glad to set six pews back on the preacher's right hand side. They didn't sing 16 stanzas of just as I am. They didn't get me to raise my hand. I didn't one, two, three, repeat after me. My man of God was three quarters of the way back in the congregation standing up in a pew preaching the Holy Ghost came by and pulled the blinders off my eyes I stood up, kicked pocket books out of the way, stepped over legs, made my way to an old fashioned altar, my phone's in the car but I got a picture my wife took on my phone of me standing on the very spot where now this won't go with this new ecumenical a recovering fundamentalist crowd but when I got up I came to an old fashioned altar and now in repentance and faith and got born again John 3 3 born again I'm here to tell you that there is a story I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love she said I heard a story I heard about your God how he came down there into Egypt kicked the gates off of it destroyed the land destroyed destroyed the army let y'all uh, fill your pockets and your wagons up uh, and led you across on dry ground she said I know that your God can deliver right. it's not only of deliverance what's what she said and what he did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan Tihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed he has a way not only of delivering you. She said, I heard he can defeat your enemies. Yeah. He has a way of taking all of that that held you in bondage and utterly destroying it. That's why some of you can testify that you was a drunk, but you ain't never had to go back to it, praise God, because he walked you out of that bar room, pulled you out of that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Pulled you out of that bottle and destroyed that bottle in your life. There's no Egypt to go back to. There's no Sihon and Og to go back to. The people of God are living in their land. They've lost their heads. That people destroyed. He has a way of us destroying what held you for so long she said I heard a story thank God the greatest love story I ever heard was that Jesus loved me thank God when he should have threw me in hell he should have wiped his hands of me and let me be this woman's a harlot she's as wicked as anybody in the town trapped in sin but Jesus sent a story and told her you can be delivered I can destroy I'm going to just go ahead and give you a spoiler alert before we get her out of Jericho he's going to tear down everything he's going to kill everybody there's going to be no Jericho to go back to right here. Good. He, when, a, when the Lord enters a harlot's house he enters with his servants he entered with his story here's the message he entered with his salvation what's this look at verse number 12 with me now she's talking let's, let's read verse 11 it said as soon as we had heard these things how he had delivered y'all 
had destroyed all your enemies. She said, as soon as we... Now, she's speaking for the whole people. She said, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Watch what she says in verse 11. Here's her confession. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. What she say? The Lord your God is God. Earlier in the verse, she said, when we heard that story, our hearts did melt, been abused, been taken advantage of, been shortchanged, been spit upon, mocked, ridiculed, made fun of. She's an outcast in the whole city of Jericho. But she said, uh, I had a stony heart. Can't be in that business and not have a heart of stone, not hate folk, not be tough, not have a thick skin but she said when I heard that story anybody remember that morning or that day when you really heard that story and your heart started melting inside of you and all of a sudden you said he is God he is the Lord he is a savior he is a Messiah I'm telling you I believe she confessed with her mouth and believed in her heart everything's a changing now everything's a getting different now she has a confession this morning I want to, you to know that I believe that he is Lord uh, in heaven above uh, and in earth beneath I'm going to go ahead and say this because I've determined in evangelism to at least find one little place to nick everybody make, make somebody a little off uh, a little mad so here it is when I pastored I used to have a fella he'd be tore up now he was serious He'd get up and he'd come down. He'd want the pastor to pray with him. Now, I pastored in redneck, backwood, country places. You didn't want to necessarily get down and turn your back on some of them people in that congregation. So I'd have a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, a, a lady, pray with the ladies, and I'd watch the service, continue the invitation or whatever. But he wants the pastor. He said, Pastor, I need you to pray with me. Pastor, I need you to pray. So I got down. I said, what are we going to pray about? He said, I want you to pray. I make Jesus Lord. And I prayed with him. I went home that afternoon. My wife had a spread on Sunday dinner at the table. She used to cook way too much. And she had a spread laid out, and the Holy Ghost convicted me. I told her, I said, I got to go back over to the church. I went back over to church, got in my office, got on my face for God. Uh, and when we got done, I said, I promise you, Lord, uh, it'll probably run him off and his whole family. I mean, when you ain't got many and you got a husband, wife, four kids, that's the last ones you want to run off, amen. But I said, I'll tell him what you told me. So it wasn't long. Uh, God got to moving in the service. I was a preaching. Here he come. Now, he was sincere and serious. Tears run down his face. He was broke. He got down there. I tried to move over here and act like I didn't know him. He's down there. Anybody over here need to come? Uh, anybody? How about over here? And then he, preacher, preacher, pastor, preacher. I finally said, yes, sir. He said, I need you to get down here and pray with me. I said, let me get one to me. He said, oh, I want you to pray with me. I said, what we're going to pray about, son? He said, I want you to get down here and pray that I'll make Jesus Lord. I said, get up and go on back to the pew and sit down with your family because God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. You're not going to make Jesus Lord. He is born Lord. He's always been Lord. He'll always be Lord. He's One day when we crown him, we're not going to crown him to make him Lord. We're just going to acknowledge that he is Lord and every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess and Rahab from a condemned people a harlot by trade said your God is God in heaven and he's God on earth and she got in hallelujah she got born again Some people say how them Old Testament saints get saved they got saved the same way you did by grace through faith hallelujah they, she put her trust she said he's God my heart melted that's conviction if I ever read it in the Bible and she began to believe and she confessed it with her mouth we see her confession he visited her with his salvation not only her confession but if we read verses 13 and 14 it, uh, you'll see that she enters a covenant she gets brought in to a covenant with God's people that's what happened to you when you got born again got brought into a covenant with God's people. Now I don't know if that means anything to you, but Jesus hung between heaven and earth 
in the pitch black darkness when he was hanging bearing our sins in his own body shedding that redeeming blood God the Father got up walked over cut the Genesis 1-3 light out and the universe went dark and in that darkness that locked me and you out and that darkness locked the Son in with the Father the Son uh, cut a covenant with his own body signed it with his own blood uh, with the Father for a no account meal hill boy for a harlot named Rahab uh, for sinners uh, who are now saved by the good grace of God sitting in this building this morning. That's why when I sinned and faltered and failed and done something wrong, Jesus didn't come along and kick me out and say I'm taking my salvation back and throwing you into hell. He said no. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Hallelujah. I'm in a covenant that was cut with his own body. Signed his own blood. It doesn't rest on me. It rest on him. She's in a covenant. In our salvation, we see her confidence. She tells them, she said, I need a true token. I need something. I need something from you that I can hold on to. If you go, if we're in a covenant and I'm going to survive this and you're not going to kill me and under the judgment of God like everybody else she said I need a covenant he said well when you let us down off the wall to go back to God's people said that scarlet rope that you let us down with that'll be the, co- that'll be the token of your covenant now I don't know about you but there was some time passed from the time she made this confession entered this covenant till they come across and took Jericho I tell you what I think she did. I think the first thing she did, she went out there on the front door and put closed, out of business. Harlot doesn't live here anymore. And she waited. And her daddy might have said, uh, we don't have any money. The money's running out. And how do you know that them men wasn't just telling you that? How do you know that when this thing's over and they come across that Jordan, uh, they don't kill us? Uh, And she said, I've got a token gift. Uh, I've got something that they said. uh, They told me when they come across, hang it out my window. And it was my token gift. And she said, I don't have anything else. I imagine every night, now this is Weaver country commentary, this ain't in your King James Bible, but I believe every night when she went to bed, she put that wrapped herself up in that red rope and laid down. If she woke up in the middle of the night and the devil tried to spook her, she said, as long as I got this, I got a promise from God. They spoke for God. She said, I got a promise from God. Hey, listen, this morning nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling I got a token if you will gift can you imagine let me give you a little weaverology here she'd hang that thing out here they come the word went out the people of God are coming across Jordan he's dried it up like he did the Red Sea and they're coming across that river and they're going to kill us now many commentators believe that one of those spies was a man from the tribe of Judah named Salmon. Now the Bible doesn't say that. So I'm not saying it's a biblical fact. But many believe it was. And we'll act like it was. She would have known him. So the game plan warrior Joshua. How are we going to take his city? Well the Lord said we're going to march around it one time a day for six days. We ain't going to say a word. We ain't going to make a sound. On the seventh day, we're going to lap it seven times. When we lap it that seven time, we're going to blow the trumpet and shout, and the walls are coming down. Don't sound. Let me just throw this in. When God gets ready to really use you, he will probably have you do something that your friends will tell you that's the craziest thing I ever heard and it'll probably look a little crazy because there ain't no doubt in my mind they have some soldiers in there were going you know they're trying to convince well he dried up the Red Sea and we've heard the stories about what he did and he, well we'll take a chance on it but they double sorted it up just in case this don't work but, uh, but I'm telling you she hung that rope out there and can you imagine whoever the spies were but let's say it was Salmon she was looking down off that wall because her house sat on the wall and she had that rope out and it's coming by and she is shaking that rope she is looking maybe she saw Salmon one of those days she said Salmon Salmon and she shook that rope and Salmon couldn't talk he couldn't say nothing can you imagine 
He's trying to march in order. I like to think Joshua being a strategist put those two men at the back and they were at the back marching. He's looking up there. He's trying to give her the nod. Uh, he's trying to give her the thumbs up. Uh, every time God may not come and just grab you up in his arms uh, but thank God for the times uh, when you got nothing and you shake if you will that old rugged cross and he gives you the wink. Uh, gives you a little nod. Blows you a little kick. Glory to God. I don't know if that's a helping you, but it's a helping me this morning. And as them days went on, no doubt she was a swinger. She said, It's a working. I believe they give me the signal. I know he's still under that covenant. I know I still got it. It's still working. Throw it back out. Wait on here to come day seven. And I believe on that six lap. He told her one more time. And they started around. She said, get all the stuff we are taking. Because the walls are about to come down. We're about to leave here. Now you can believe what you want to. All right with me. But they made that seventh lap. I believe old Simon blew her a kiss. And they blowed them trumpets and the people of God shouted. Now you can believe what you want to. The Bible said that the walls fell flat. I believe that the ground opened up and the walls fell straight down and it moved Rahab from a high rise project right down on ground level just dropped her house right on the ground you know why it dropped it on the ground cause the ground is always level at the foot of the cross it not only dropped it down there on ground level, but it made a new walkway. It made a new pathway. When she comes out of that house, she steps on a brand. Glory to God. She ain't Rahab at Harlan. She's not condemned anymore. She's part of the people of God walking on a brand new path. Got a brand new life. She's brand spanking new. Hallelujah. I believe that all of her life, Anytime she got discouraged, anytime she got down, <laughs> she'd swing that red rope. I believe they buried her with it, wrapped her up. I believe she kept it. What's that under you? The, under your head covering that? Oh, that's that rope I let the spies down with. That's my token. That's my token. I'm carrying it all the way here uh, until I see him. I don't have nothing but that old rugged bloody cross of the Lord Jesus but I'm a clinging unto it uh, until I get over there and lay it down uh, and exchange it someday for a crown I'll remain true to that old rugged cross her change her confidence was in that token gift that red rope that old rugged cross if you will salvation always crowns you she becomes part of the people of God. And she marries a man from the tribe of Judah whose name is Salmon. That's why many believe he is one of the spies. He marries a heathen, condemned woman. She's still an outcast in some of them's eyes. But now she's not just part of the family of God. Because God doesn't just leave you as an outsider. There's some look down their nose and said, we still remember what you was. Can't believe that good, hard-working man, God-fearing man, Salmon, married that floozy. She ain't fooling me. She's still a floozy. Well, God let them have a baby. And that baby's name was Boaz. And Boaz was coming back from some uh, business and looked out in the field, looked to get... He said, who is that? <laughs> said, she looked just like the dear old girl that married my dear old dad. Yeah. I don't really want one of these Jewish girls. I want one like daddy got. And he didn't rest. Naomi said he won't rest. Hallelujah. He won't rest. Jesus didn't sit down until he had made a way. He won't rest until he finds out. And when he found out, he said, that's the one for me. And so now Rahab's son, Boaz, married a girl named Ruth, a Moabitess, an outcast. And they got with child and, and had a little boy. And they named him Obed, which some say means worship. 
A Moabitess wasn't loud in the temple. She said, that's all right. I ain't got to go to the temple to worship. I worship God right here at the house. Amen. And Obed grew up and got married. And his boy had a boy. Guess what his name was? His name was Jesse. Yeah. And Jesse grew up and got married and had a house full of boys. But that baby boy, that ruddy faced one, that outcast one, you see him? He's outcast. When Samuel come to anoint him, they didn't even call him in from watching sheep. Anybody know what his name was? His name was David, the God-chosen king of Israel. And now let me say, I don't believe God pulls heaven open and lets you look. But if he does, can you imagine? He said, Rahab, come here. I'm going to let you look at what God's man, Samuel was such a man of God uh, that not a word he spoke fell to the ground. If he spoke it, it came to pass. She said, he said, I'm going to let you take a peek at what the man of God's about to do to your great, great grandson. You might have been a harlot in Jericho you might have thought you was trash some of them still look down the nose and say you worthless you ain't nothing he said let me tell you your great great grand boy is the God anointed king of all of Israel he's the king of my people and you gotta go to Matthew chapter number one cause that would be good enough but it don't stop there cause you keep following that bloodline David has a boy Solomon Solomon and then there goes on Rehoboam it keeps going and all of a sudden you get to a little virgin girl <laughs> and if God opened up heaven he'd say Rahab come over here cause that little virgin girl named Mary is about to give birth to your great 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 grandson and I, I, my uh, Gabriel's already told her call his name Jesus the same Jesus that you wore around your neck, <laughs> that you lay down with for the rest of your journey. Now, he may not do that, but can you imagine? And it might not be this way, but there's coming a day when they'll call for the royal diadem, and we'll all kneel at his feet, and they will proclaim, He is King of kings, He is Lord of lords, and they'll set the crown on his head. And you might hear Rahab say, That's my boy! That's my boy! You don't have to be what you were, you can be set free salvation not only changes you but it crowns you God has something better for you when the Lord enters a heart if you enjoyed today's message head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons and don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast as always thanks for listening